Hello everyone, welcome to the special CUBE conversation. We are here at the Power Panel conversation. I'm John Furrier in Palo Alto, California. This CUBE Studios we have remote online here to talk about the cloud technologies impact on entrepreneurship and startups. And overall ecosystem is Jim Long, who's the CEO of Digi, which is a startup around disrupting digital TV. Also has been an investor and a serial entrepreneur. Uh, Sarbeet Joal, who's the in cloud influencer strategist and investor out of Berkeley. Um, California, the Batchery, and also Joseph Jacks, Cube alumni. Actually, you guys are all Cube alumni, so great to have you on. Joseph Jacks is the, is the founder and general partner of OSS Capital, Open Source Software Capital, a new fund that's been raised specifically to commercialize and fund startups around open source software. Guys, we've got a great panel here of experts. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate Go it. Go Bears. Um, so, nice to be here. so we have a with distinguished panel, it's the power panel around cloud technology. First of all, let's get you guys' reaction to, you know, you're seeing a lot of negative news around what Facebook has become. They're essentially their own hyper hyperscale cloud with their application. They were called the um, digital, you know, um, you know, renegades or digital gangsters in the UK by the parliament, um, which okay. is built on open source software. Amazon is continuing to win. Azure's doing their thing, bundling Office 365, making it look like they're, we got more revenue, but they're catching up. Google, and then you got IBM and Oracle. And then you got an ecosystem that's impacted by this large scale. So I want to get your thoughts on the first point here. Is there room for more clouds? There's a big buzzword around multiple clouds. Is, are we going to see specialty clouds? Because Salesforce is a cloud. So the, is there room for more cloud? Jim, why don't you start? Well, I sure hope so. Uh, it, you know, the internet uh, has unfortunately become sort of the internet of monopolies and um, that doesn't do anyone any good. Uh, in fact, you bring up an interesting point. It'd be kind of interesting to see if Facebook created a uh, social, you know, social cloud for certain types of applications to use. I have no idea whether that makes any sense, but uh, Amazon's clearly been the, the big gorilla now and done an amazing job. We love using them. Uh, but we also love seeing you trying out different services that they have and then figuring out whether we want to develop them ourselves or use a specialty service. And I think that's going to be interesting, particularly in the AI area, stuff like that. So I sure hope uh, more clouds are around for all of us to take advantage of. Joseph, I want you to weigh in here because you were close to the Kubernetes trend. In fact, we were at an OpenStack event when you started uh, Kismatic, which is the movement that became KubeCon, cloud native, many, many years ago. Now you're investing in open source. The world's built on open source. There's got to be room for more clouds. Your thoughts on, on the opportunities. Yeah, thanks for having me on, John. Um, I think we need a new kind of open collaborative cloud. And to date, we haven't really seen any of the existing major um, sort of large critical mass cloud providers participate in that, that type of model. Um, arguably, Google has probably participated and contributed the most in the open source ecosystem, contributing TensorFlow and Kubernetes and Go, uh, lots of different open source projects, but they're ultimately focused on gravitating huge amounts of compute and storage cycles to their cloud platform. So I think one of the big missing uh, links in the industry is as we continue to see the rise of these large vertically integrated uh, proprietary sort of control planes for computing and storage and applications and services, I think as, as, as uh, the open source community and the open source ecosystem continues to grow and explode, we'll need a third sort of provider, one that isn't based on a monopoly or based on um, a traditional proprietary software uh, business like Microsoft kind of uh, transitioning their enterprise customers to services, uh, sort of Amazon in the, in the first camp, um, vertically integrated menu buffet of all these different uh, compute, storage, uh, networking, services, application, middleware. Um, Microsoft focused on sort of uh, building managed services of, of, of their sort of software portfolio. I think we need a third model where we have sort of an open set of interfaces and an open standards based cloud provider that might be a pure software company. It might be, uh, it might be a company that builds on the, the rails and the infrastructure that Amazon has laid down, spending tens of billions in CapEx, uh, or it could be something based on uh, a project like Kubernetes or, or built, built from the community ecosystem. So I think we need something like that just to sort of provide, speed the innovation and disaggregate the 
the services away from a, a monolithic kind of closed vendor like Amazon or, or Azure. I want to come back to that whole startup opportunity, but I want to get Sar Sarbjini in here because we've been in the B2B area with just last week at IBM Think 2019. Obviously they're trying to you know, get back into the cloud game, but you know, this digital transformation that has been the cliche for almost you know, a couple of years now, if not five or plus, business has got to move to the cloud. So it's a whole new ball game of, of complete cultural shift. Um, they need stability. So I, you know, I, can, I want to talk more about this open cloud, which I love that conversation, but give me the blocking and tackling capabilities first, because I got to get out of that old CapEx model, move to an operating model, transform my business, whether it's multi-cloud. So Sarvi, what's your take on the cloud market for the, say the enterprise? Yeah, I think for the enterprise, the which are sitting in the data center and moving those to cloud, um, it's a cumbersome task. Uh, for that to, to work, uh, they actually don't need all the bells and whistles what Amazon has uh, in the periphery, if you will. They need just core things like compute, network, and storage, and, and some uh, other in the sort of services, maybe database, uh, maybe Redshift, and stuff like that. Uh, but they just want to move uh, those applications as is to start with, and with some re-platforming uh, and with, with some changes. Like they, they don't want to make much changes to first when they start the, moving those applications. Um, but our sort of minds are polluted by this thinking. Like when we see if uh, Facebook being formed by a couple of people or a company of six people sold for a billion dollars, uh, all, it just uh, messes up with our mind uh, on the enterprise side. Hey, we can do that too. We can move that fast and so forth. But that it, 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 it's a sort of a tragic that we think that way. Uh, what, having said that, uh, I think we have talked about this in the past. Uh, if you are doing anything innovative, like a systems of innovation, if you're building those at, even at the enterprise, I think cloud is the way to go. To your original question, if there's room for newer cloud, cloud players, I, I think there is, uh, uh, provided that we can uh, detach the, the platforms from the environments they are sitting on. So that proprietiness has to kind of, uh, it has to be lowered. The degree of proprietiness has to be lowered. Uh, it can be through open source, I think mainly it can be from open technologies. They don't have to be open source, but portable. Yeah, right? J so JJ was mentioning that, I think that's a big point. Jim Long, you're an entrepreneur. I mean, you've been a VC, you know all the VCs been around for a while, but you also, you're an entrepreneur, you're a serial entrepreneur, starting out at Cal Berkeley back in the day. You know, small ideas can move fast and you're, you're building on Amazon you, and you've got a media kind of thing going on. There's a cloud opportunity for you because you, you are cloud native because you're building the cloud. How do you see, how do you see playing out? Because you're scaling with Amazon. Well, so we obviously, as a new startup, don't have the issues the enterprise folks have, and uh, I, I do, I could really see, uh, you know, the enterprise customers, what we used to call the Fortune 500, for example, getting together and insisting on, you know, at least a base set of APIs that uh, Amazon and 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 uh, Microsoft, etc., adopt. Uh, and for a startup, it's really about um, moving fast with your own solution that solves a problem. Uh, so you don't necessarily care too much that you're tied into Amazon completely uh, because you know that if you need to, you can make a change someday. Uh, but they do such a good job for us and their costs, uh, while they can certainly be lower and we certainly would like more volume discounts, they're pretty darn amazing uh, across the network and we, uh, across the internet, we, we do try to price out other folks just for the heck of it. Uh, we did doing that recently with CDNs, for example. Uh, but for us, we're actually creating a hybrid cloud, if you will, a purpose-built cloud to support local television stations. And, uh, and we, do, we do think that's going to be, you know, along with the, using Amazon, you know, a unique cloud with our own APIs that we will hopefully uh, have lots of different TV apps use our hybrid cloud for part of their application uh, to service local TV can yeah. So it's kind of an interesting play for us. The, the B2B part of it is uh, we're hoping to be pretty successful as well. And 
and we hope to ha maybe have multiple uh, cl cloud vendors in our mix, you know, not that the, our users will know who's behind us, maybe Amazon for something, Limelight for another or whatever, for example. Well, you got to be concerned about lock-in as you become in the cloud, that's something that everyone's worried about. JJ, I want to get back to you on the investment thesis because you have a cutting edge business model around investing in open source software. And there's two schools of thought in the open source community, you know, free contributions, great, and let that be organic. And then there's now commercialization. There are real value, there's real value being created in open source. You had put together a chart with your team about the billions of exits, billions of dollars in exits from open source companies. So how, what, what are you investing in? What do you see as opportunities for entrepreneurs like Jim and others that are out there looking at scaling their business? How do you look at success? What's your advice? What do you see as leading indicators? I think I'll broadly answer your question with a model that we've been thinking a lot about. We're going to start writing uh, publicly about and, and probably eventually maybe publish a book or two on it. And it's, it's around the sort of fundamental uh, perspective of creating value and capturing value. So if you, if you modeled, um, this is sort of a, a famous uh, investor um, and entrepreneur in Silicon Valley who, who uh, has commonly modeled these things using two different uh, uh, letter variables, X and Y. Um, but I'll, I'll give you the sort of perspective of modeling value creation and value capture around open source as compared to um, closed source or proprietary software. So if, if you look at value creation uh, modeled as X and value capture modeled as Y, where X and Y are two independent variables um, with a fully proprietary or sort of proprietary software company based approach, whether you're building a cloud service or a uh, proprietary software product or whatever, just software company, your value creation exponent is bounded, typically bounded by two things, um, capital and fundraising into the entity creating the software and the centralization of research and development, meaning engineering output for producing the software. Um, and so those two things are, are tightly coupled to and bounded to the company. With commercial open source software, the uh, exact opposite is, is true. So uh, value creation is decoupled and independent from funding and value creation is also decentralized in terms of the research and development aspects. So you have this sort of decentralized, um, community-based, crowdsourced, or, or, or sort of internet global phenomena of contributing to a code base that isn't necessarily owned or fully controlled by a single entity. And that th those two properties are sort of decoupled from funding and decentralized R&D are fundamentally changing the value creation kind of exponent. Now, we, now let's look at the value capture variable. With pr proprietary software company or, or a proprietary technology company, you're primarily looking at two constituents capturing value, people who pay for accessing the service of the software and people who create the software. And so those two constituents capture all the value. They capture, you know, the, the, the vendor selling the software captures maybe 10 or 20% of the value. And the rest of the value I would express and say is that customer is capturing the rest of the value. M most economists don't um, express value capture as capturable by an end user or a customer. I think that's a mistake. Jim, so you're react now, okay. Jim, you're reacting yeah, to that I, because there's an article that went around this weekend from Motherboard. The internet was built on free labor, open source developers. Is that sustainable? So, you're, Jim, what's your reaction to JJ's comments about the interactions and the dynamic between value creation, value capture, free versus sustainable funding? Well, if, uh, if you can so, sort of mix both together, that's what I would like. I haven't really ever figured out how to make open source uh, work in our business model, but I haven't really tried that hard. Uh, it's an intriguing concept for sure, particularly if we come up with, you know, APIs that are specific to say local television or something like that. And, uh, and maybe some special processes that, that do things that are of interest to the wider community. Uh, so that's something I, I, I do plan to look at uh, because I do agree that if you, I mean, we use open source, we use this thing called FFmpeg and several other things. And we're really happy that uh, there's people out there adding value to them, et cetera. And then we have our own, uh, you know, versions, et cetera. So uh, we'd like to contribute to the community if we could figure out how. So Abhijit, your reaction to JJ's uh, thesis there? I, I think two things. Uh, 
I will comment on it from two different aspects. One is the lack of standards and then open source becoming the standard, right? I, I think uh, open source uh, kind of projects take birth and life in its own uh, because we have a lack of standard, like because the, these different vendors can't agree on standards. So like, remember we used to have uh, uh, service-oriented architecture. We have Microsoft pushing some standards from one side and IBM pushing from other. Uh, the SOAP uh, versus uh, XCBL and XML, uh, a different sort of, sort, of, sort of paradigms, right? But then the REST uh, API became the de facto standard, right? It just took over. I think what REST has done for software in the last about uh, sort of two, uh, 10 years or so, like ha nothing has done that for, for, for us. Yeah, well, Kubernetes is right now looking pretty good. So if you look at, you know, JJ, Kubernetes, yeah. the, the movement you really were pioneering on, is having similar dynamic. I mean, Kubernetes is becoming a forcing function for solidarity in the community of cloud native, as well as an actual interoperable orchestration layer for multiple clouds and other services. So JJ, your, your thoughts on how open source continues as some of these new technologies like Kubernetes continue to hit the scene. Um, is there any trajectory change in open source that you see that you could share? I'd love to get your insights on what's next behind, you know, the rise of Kubernetes is happening What's next? I think more abstractly from Kubernetes, we, we, we believe that if you just look at the rate of innovation as the primary factor for progress and forward change in the world, open source software has the highest rate of innovation of any technology creation phenomena. And as a consequence, we're seeing more standards emerge from the open source ecosystem we're seeing more disruption happen from the open source ecosystem. We're seeing more new technology companies and new paradigms and shifts happen from the open source ecosystem. And kind of all, all progress across the, the largest, most difficult sort of compound um, sensitive problems influenced and kind of sourced from the, the open source ecosystem and the, the open source world overall, whether it's chip design or machine learning or computing innovations or new types of architectures or new types of um, developer paradigms, um, bi you know, biological breakthroughs. There's, there's, there's kind of things up and down the, the technology spectrum that have, have, uh, have a lot to, 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 to sort of thank, thank open source for. Um, we, we think that the future of technology and the future of, of, uh, of software is really that open source is at the core as opposed to the periphery or the edges. And so today, every software technology company and cloud providers included have closed proprietary cores, meaning that where the core is the data path, the runtime, the core business logic of the company. Uh, today, uh, that core is proprietary software or closed source software. And, 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 and yet what is also true is that the edges, the wrappers, the sort of crust, the periphery of every technology company, we have lots of open source. We have client libraries and bindings and languages and integrations, configuration, UIs, and so on. But the cores are proprietary. We think the following will happen over the next few decades. We think the future will gradually shift to from closed proprietary cores to open cores, where instead of a proprietary core, an open cores where you have a core open source software project, as the fundamental building block for the company. So for example, Hadoop caused the creation of MapR and Cloudera and Hortonworks. Spark caused the creation of Databricks. Kafka caused the creation of Confluent. Git caused the creation of GitHub and GitLab. Um, and this type of commercial open source software model where there's a core open source project as the kernel building block for the company, and then an extension of intellectual property or wrappers around that open source project where you can derive value capture uh, and charge for licensed product with, with the company and uh, an impressed customer. We, we think that model is, is where the future is headed. And it's includes cloud providers, basically selling proprietary services that could be based on a mixture of open source projects, but perhaps not fundamentally on a core open source project. Now we, we think generally like abstractly with maybe somewhat of a, of a reductionist um, explanation there, but that 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 open core future is very likely, 
fundamentally because of the rate of innovation being the highest with, with the open source model in general. All right, that's great stuff. Jim, you're a historian of tech, you've lived it. Your thoughts on some of the emerging trends around cloud because you're disrupting linear TV with Digia in a new way using cloud technology. How do you see cloud evolving? Well, I think, uh, I think it, uh, along the lines we discussed, uh, certainly I think that's a really interesting model and uh, the, having the open source be the center of the universe and figure out how to have maybe some proprietary stuff, if I can use that word, uh, around it that other people can take advantage of, but maybe you get the value uh, capture and, and build a business on that. Uh, that makes a lot of sense and, and, and could certainly <clears throat> fit in the uh, TV industry, if you will, from, from where I sit. Um, bring services to businesses and consumers. So uh, it's not like there's, you know, some reason it wouldn't work, you know, it's bound to, there's bound to be, figure out a way. And if you could get a whole mass of people around the world working on the core technology, um, and it, if it is sort of unique to what the mission of your, what your, or at least the marketplace you're going after, yeah. that could be pretty interesting. And that'd be great to see a, a, a lot of different uh, you know, new mini clouds, if you will, develop around that stuff would be pretty cool. Sarvjeet, I want you to talk about um, scale because you also had experience working with Rackspace. Rackspace was early on, they were trying to build the cloud and you know, OpenStack came out of that and guess what? The world was moving so fast. Amazon was a bullet train uh, just flying down the tracks and it just felt like Rackspace and their cloud you know, and OpenStack just couldn't keep up. So is scale an issue and how do people compete against scale in your mind? I think scale is an issue uh, and in software chops is an issue. So if, if the, 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 there's some patterns, right? So one pattern is that we uh, tend to see that the open source is now not very good at the application side. Like you, you will hardly see any applications being built as open source. And also on the on the extreme side, open source is pretty um, sort of lame, lame if you will, at very core of the things like OpenStack failed for that reason, right? But it, it's pretty good in the middle, uh, as, uh, as Joseph said, right? So uh, building pipes, building some platforms based on open source, the the hooks integration, it's pretty good there. Actually, the, the, I think that I think that pattern will continue. Hopefully, it will go into the deeper into the core. Uh, which we want to see. Um, the the other pattern is I think the 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 software chops like one one vendor has to lead the lead the project for a certain amount of time. If that project goes into sort of uh, open, uh, like anybody can grab it, and a lot of people contributors sort of jump in very quickly, it, it, it tends to fail. That that's what happened to I think OpenStack. And, and there was there were many re other reasons behind that, but I think that was the main reason. Uh, and because we were smaller at all, um, and we didn't have that that much software chops, I hate to say that, but uh, then yeah. IBM could can throw like hundred bodies uh, a week. Yeah, and they did. And look where they are. So so does HP, right? And look where they are. <laughs> all right. So I'd love to have a panel, power panel on open source. Certainly, uh, JJ's been in the thick of it as well as other folks in the community. I want to just kind of end on um, kind of a, a lightweight question for you guys. Yeah. What have you guys learned? Go down the line, start with Jim, Sarbeet, and then JJ, we'll finish with you. Something, share something that you've learned over the past three months that, you, that um, moved you or that people should know about in tech or um, cloud trends that, that's notable. What's uh, something new that you've learned? Uh, in my case, it, uh, was really just uh, spending some time in the last few months uh, getting to know our end users a little bit better, uh, consumers, and some of the impact that having free uh, internet television has on their lives. Um, and that's really motivating and, and something, else, um, something as simple as you, you might take for granted, but um, lower income people don't necessarily have a TV that works or a hotel room that has a TV that works or heaven forbid they're homeless and all that. So um, it's really gratifying to me to see people uh, get sort of tuning back into their local media through television 
just by offering it on their phone and, and laptops. And what are you going to do as a result of that to get the different action? What's the next step for you? What's the action item? Well, we're hoping uh, once our, our uh, product gets filled out with the major networks, et cetera, that we actually provide a community uh, uh, attachment to it so that we have television, you know, over the air television channels on, is the main part of the app. And then the side part of the app could be any IP stream from city council meetings to high schools, to colleges, to uh, local, you know, community groups local, uh, even religious uh, situations or, or festivals or whatever, uh, and really try to tie that in. We really like to use local television as a way to strengthening all local media and local communities. That's, That's a great vision, mission. at least. It's a great mission you guys have at Digit. Thanks for, for sharing that. Sarbi, what have you learned over the past uh, quarter, three months, uh, that was notable for you and the impact, and doesn't that change you a little bit? So what, what actually what, what I have I have gravitated towards uh, in last what uh, three to six months is the the blockchain actually I, I was I was light on that like what it can do for us and, and is is there really a thing behind it and can we leverage it uh, I'm seeing more and more actually uh, usage of that in in sort of uh, food SCM uh, supply chain management and in healthcare and some other uh, sort mm -hmm. of uh, uh, use cases, if you will. Um, I, I, I'm intrigued by it, and there's a lot of activity there. I think uh, I think there's some there's there, there's some legs behind it. So I'm excited about that. And are you doing a blockchain project as a result? Are you still tire kicking? kicking no, no actually, uh, I will play with it. I, I'm a practitioner. Yeah. I play with it. I write my code and then play All with right. it and see <laughs> okay. what, what is that level of effort it takes to do that. And uh, as you know, I wrote the Alexa scale a couple of days, a couple of weeks back. Yeah. and play with AI and stuff like that. So I, I tried to do that myself before I yeah. say that. We're, we're, we're hoping blockchain uh, helps uh, even out the TV ad economy and gets rid of middlemen and, and makes more trusting transactions between local businesses and stuff. Right. So at least I say that, I don't really know what I'm talking about. It but, sounds good though. <laughs> you get a good. new it round of funding good. on that soundbite alone. JJ, <laughs> what have you learned in the past couple months that's uh, new to you and that changed you or uh, made you do something different? I've learned over the last few months, so OSS Capital is, is a, f a few months and change old. And so just kind of getting started on that. And it's really, a, I think, a potentially more than one decade, probably multi-decade kind of most, mostly consensus building effort. Uh, there is such a huge lack of consensus and agreement in the industry. It's a fascinatingly polarizing area, uh, the sort of general topic of open source technology, economics, value creation, value capture. Um, so my learnings over the past few months uh, have just intensified in terms of the lack of consensus I've seen in the industry. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to write a little bit more about observations there and sort of put thoughts out. And that's that's kind of been the biggest takeaway over the last few months. For I'm me. sure you learned a lot of all the lawyer conversations, setting up a fund learnings there probably too, right? I mean, all the <laughs> detail. All right, JJ, thanks so much. Sarbi, Jim, thanks for joining me on this cloud power panel, cloud conversation impact to entrepreneurship, open source, Jim Long, Sarbi Jawal, and Joseph Jacks, JJ, thanks for joining us. The CUBE conversation here in Palo Alto, I'm John Furrier. Thanks for watching. Thanks, John.